Thank you for that very gracious introduction. Today we will be talking about Kung Fu. As my colleague and friend Brian Kennedy has noted, there is no subject that is more beloved in the world of Kung Fu fiction than the lost fight book, the lost martial arts manual. There are countless films, uh, TV programs, wuxia novels, uh, radio programs that all focus on this image of a lost or better yet stolen fight book that holds the secret to ancient fighting prowess. In Chinese fiction, heroes and heroines go to just immense lengths to procure these books because these books are not just a source of technical knowledge, they're also the ultimate status symbol in this fictional land of the rivers and lakes. They're, a, they're your marker of you know, being a true martial artist. Today, you know, in gratitude for inviting me here, I would hope, to, I would like to reveal for all of you an example of one of these lost fight books that is very interesting because it holds a unique set of insights, not so much into fighting itself, but into the evolving nature of the southern Chinese martial arts during the late Qing dynasty, you know, the final decades of the Qing dynasty, a period in time in which a lot of the styles of Kung Fu that are most popular today, things like Hung Ga, Choi Li Foot, Southern Mantis, Wing Chun, were literally just beginning to evolve as this book was written. So it's, it's very important historically. Um, but I'd also like to talk about something that hasn't really come up yet in, in the um, conference, questions of translation. How, how do books get translated? What happens when translation is more than just linguistic, when we begin to move across cultural and temporal boundaries with our translation, right? Um, so that means, to do that, I need to identify the translator of this book who has previously been anonymous. And in talking about him, I hope to reveal a little bit about his impact on uh, the public perception of the Chinese martial arts in the late 19th century. Alfred Lister, that guy up there in my title, is basically an unknown figure right now in the field of martial arts studies. If he is remembered at all, it is as a middling bureaucrat in Hong Kong in the late 19th century. Um, he, he, the highest post that he ever achieved was acting treasurer of the colony. He was the harbor master. He was the postmaster general for a little bit. For a little bit. What is generally not appreciated is that Alfred Lister, in addition to being a very fine linguist, uh, was also someone with a real passion for Cantonese popular culture, what he called street culture. And that interest led him into the realm of gambling dens and opera theaters and public marketplaces and prisons and all of the sorts of people where you were likely to find Chinese martial artists. Right? And that appears to have sparked what was the very first sustained multi-year research project that any Western scholar ever undertook into the realm of the Chinese martial arts. Now, if it Lister is so important, why don't you know who he is? Right? I, I think that his contributions have gone underappreciated for two reasons. The first is that he actively hid his identity. He published most of his important works anonymously, as a good gentleman scholar of the 1870s was supposed to do, right? He was a dilettante. He wasn't trying to make his living this way. He was a gentleman. He did not sign his name to some of his most critical works. So in a sense, we were never supposed to know who produced these articles. Secondly, Lister's interests were not so much historical or technical. And those are the genres of writing that are really popular with us in this room today, right? You know, if he had written a technical manual on the martial arts, you can be sure one of us would have tracked him down by now. But Lister didn't want to learn how to do Chinese boxing, and he certainly didn't want to teach it to anybody. That would have been very far beneath his social status as a British gentleman, right? Instead, Lister's interests in the Chinese martial arts were more theoretical and more anthropological in nature. By looking at them, he hoped to do two things. First off, he wanted to understand something about popular Cantonese culture, right? That, that was his hobby. But secondly, and more universally, he noted that, you know, around the globe, I see this pattern where socially marginal people come together in networks where they invent institutions and they invent vocabularies, they invent languages, and they use those invented languages to bequeath social status on themselves. 
And you know what? Fighting seems right to be right at the heart of it. So why is it around the globe I'm seeing boxing and fighting used as a way to artificially create status for marginal people? Right? He was very interested in that question. Now, due to Lister's sardonic style and his harsh judgments about the effectiveness of the Chinese martial arts, here's a spoiler, he didn't think they were very effective, um, most of the people who've come across his work, his an anonymous work, have thought, ah, this is kind of interesting, it's curious, but they dismiss it. Or they say it's just a typical product of late 19th century imperialism. Ah, you know, this is what all white guys in China sounded like. And that's really a mistake. You need to read Lister much more deeply and much more carefully because he was someone who actually had a very complex relationship with the powers that be. And he had a very interesting set of theories about the role of linguistic translation in facilitating cross-cultural understanding. That was something he was very interested in. Plus, he had these sociological insights about the Chinese martial arts. And in all honesty, the kind of stuff that was available in your average marketplace in Hong Kong in 1870 was not fantastic. Uh, you know, Lister was kind of telling the truth, and I think a lot of Chinese martial artists today get offended when they read his accounts of what was really going on because it doesn't live up to what they would like to imagine was going on, and I don't think we should hold Lister responsible for that. All right. Perhaps Lister's greatest achievement was this article here, right? It, it's... Uh, he discovered a short manual, and uh, he published uh, a discussion of it under the title The Noble Art of Self-Defense. Right? So this is a partial translation and a description of the work, and it's really invaluable to students of martial arts studies because it tells us that there is an entire genre of uh, martial arts books that existed in late imperial China that are now totally lost, that we did not even know existed. There's not one of them left in any collection around the globe, at least nothing that is properly categorized, maybe something stuck in a cubbyhole someplace, but you know, we don't have a single uh, example of this genre. The only way we know about it is from Lister's description of these works that were fairly commonly available. And these works, the fact that they were out there, actually, if you begin to think about it, tell us a lot about what was happening in the marketplace for the Chinese martial arts in the late 19th century that we hadn't thought before. So who was Alfred Lister? In many ways, Lister's story begins not with his birth, but with the British acquisition of uh, Kowloon and kind of the rest of Hong Kong in the 1860s, right? Uh, when the British kind of got the peninsular part of Hong Kong, that, that's where the big Chinese population was, so they got you know, more space for their ports, but now suddenly they had this giant Chinese population that they actually had to be able to talk to which had never been a problem with Hong Kong initially because there hadn't been that many Chinese residents in Central. And so they decided we got to hire a bunch of translators, but not just that, we have to expand our entire civil service, right? And we need a civil service that speaks Chinese. This was new for the British. And so they went to the best, well, actually, they went to the middle class public schools in England and they started holding, you know, contests and they promised big salaries and rapid advancements if you would be willing to move to Hong Kong and learn Chinese and become a civil servant. And in 1865, someone that we have no previous record of, a young man named Alfred Lister, shows up. Right? And Lister turned out to be a fantastic linguist. He learned Chinese very, very quickly, very well. Unfortunately, his career was rather inauspicious. He was supposed to get this three-year training period. Yeah, he never got it. They were so desperate for people. They just threw him right in and made him the harbor master on day one. Right? You can imagine how well that went. And it kind of goes downhill from there because after he's the harbor master, he becomes a judge. So he's like 19 years old. Right? <laughs> um, and then after that, our next set of records, we have Lister desperately trying to stop communicable disease outbreaks by figuring out how to regulate brothels. Right? You know, no public health background, but we've got the plague, so something's got to be done. Um, after that, Lister caused a major scandal that probably permanently damaged his career. The scandal went all the way to Parliament. What happened was he went to inspect a charity temple uh, where they were supposedly storing bodies and coffins be before they were shipped home to be buried, and he discovered that not everyone who was deposited there was actually dead. 
and that in effect this was actually a hostel where we were dumping people to like die in their own filth. And he very accurately documented this and it like nearly brought down the colony's government. And the end result of it was actually the creation of the first public hospital for Chinese people uh, in Hong Kong. So, you know, Lister was involved with overly interesting things. But when you read his writings, um, you know, what you see in them is an individual who is actually very quick to criticize people like this. He is quick to criticize the British administrators in Hong Kong, Westerners in China in, generally, in general. So while well, we read Lister today and he seems very harsh in his dealings with the Chinese, if you were reading Lister in the 1870s, that's not what you heard. What you heard was someone who was too sympathetic towards the Chinese, almost suspiciously sympathetic towards the Chinese for someone who was supposed to be an administrator for the crown. As such, it's no surprise that Lister's career kind of plateaued early with all of this. And as his obituary, uh, he died of Bright's disease in 1890 in the North China Herald indicates, he died with relatively few friends. Still, that same obituary went on to remember Lister's many, many publications as a young man and, and how happy they made people, how, how much people loved them. So, and, and we don't have that many publications with Lister's name on them right there. So, so right there is an indication something interesting is going on. So what was it that Alfred Lister wrote? What kind of author was he? The short answer is he wrote a lot of poetry. Uh, Lister was actually remembered while he was alive as a very talented literary critic, right? Uh, so he kind of had this dual career. Yeah, he was an administrator by day, but like Batman, he was a literary critic by night. And he also kind of an amateur poet. And, you know, literary criticism of poetry wouldn't seem to have anything to do with fight books, but you actually have to pay close attention to that part of Lister's career because when he engages with the great sinologists of the age, guys like Professor James Legg, who, you know, he just merciless, mercilessly savaged, um, Lister was laying out and developing his own theory of translation. And it is a really interesting theory of translation. It's like reading Umberto Eco in the 1870s. Like Lister straight up says, the only proper translation is a mistranslation. It's, it's incredible stuff. Um, basically, his theory of translation is going to have a really important impact on how he deals with the martial arts and goes on to present them to a Western audience. So we've got to know a little bit about that. Uh, Lister's very first treatment of the martial arts, at least the first one that I've been able to locate in the historical record, emerged out of what you might consider his more literary pursuits. In 1869, the Duke of Edinburgh was touring Asia, and he stopped in Hong Kong, and he spent a night at the Tung Hing Theater, where Lister was also present, probably acting as the Duke's translator. And the Duke saw two operas that night. One was a very respectable historical, you know, opera, you know, based on the Three Kingdoms just like you'd expect. And the other one was a comedy. It was a farce. It was called Aelin's Pig. And this particular kung fu comedy revolved around such cheerful topics as compulsive gambling, alcoholism, domestic abuse, and the martial arts. So Lister initially wrote up a short summary of this kung fu comedy for a memorial book that was published celebrating the Duke's visit, and that should have been the end of it, but he couldn't let it go. There was something about this play that just lodged in his brain, and it was the complexity of trying to translate a Cantonese opera for an English-speaking audience, both culturally and linguistically. It was such a challenge. So in the, the very first issue of the, uh, the China Review that came out in 1873, he graced the readers with an article, one of the few that he actually signed with his own name, in which he provided a translation of this play in which he gave just enough discussion of the Chinese martial arts to make it all sensible to Western readers. And he tells the story of how he came across it. It was very interesting. He was skulking around the marketplace looking for street literature, because this is what he did in his time off. And he came across a copy of the opera's libretto. So he's like, great, I will translate this, because now this opera's kind of famous because the Duke has seen it, so people are going to want to read it. And he opens up the libretto, and he's crushed, because he's never actually read an opera libretto before. And a Cantonese opera libretto is 
just a list of key lines. That's all it is. It is very, very skeletal. And he's like, I can't publish this because it won't convey to anyone the feeling of what it was actually like to be there. They won't understand it. They won't understand the theater. They won't understand the performance. For God's sake, it's a comedy. It turns out none of the jokes are in the script. They're ad-libbing the jokes on a nightly basis. This will not do. So Lister sets out to translate the script by just adding things to it. He adds a list of characters. He adds costumes. He adds stage direction. He adds everything that you would expect to see in a Western script so that the audience can kind of understand it, right? And that really tells you what you need to know about his theory of translation. Lister did not fundament, he fundamentally, Lister believed that authors do not have rights. Audiences have rights. Readers have rights, right? Authors can make no claim to having rights, to, to, to a right to a literal translation. Instead, readers have a right to understand the text that's put before them. And he said, in order to understand a text that's put before you, if it's coming from a very alien place, what you have to do is you have to relate the symbols of this other culture to symbols that fulfill the same function in your culture, okay? So he's doing a symbolic swapping here. So there's one scene in Alan's Pig where we've got you know, some of our aforementioned compulsive wife-beating gambling kung fu guys uh, walking down the stage singing a song. And of course, they're singing a Cantonese song, which you know, is not going to make any sense to someone in English. And so he replaces an English folk, he, he swaps in an English folk song instead. And he knows he's going to get criticized by his readers. So he gives us this paragraph in which he defends what he's doing. He says, so as ah and oh is not a common termination in English melodies for the less instructed classes, kind of the consonants that Chinese uh, songs end on, and as those same classes do incline to fo lo or fo la, in, you know, as a refrain, I stand by my fo lo, I stake my reputation on fo lo, right? Now, that grandiose declaration was being made for comedic effect. I mean, he was, after all, translating a farce. But you got to remember it, because that tells you what you need to know about Lister as a translator as we move on to his discussions of the martial arts. Yeah, wait a second, where am I? Engraved? Yeah, okay, that's good enough. All right, so Lister was fascinated by martial artists and, and, and he decided that the most interesting thing about them was actually the linguistics of what they were doing, the way they were inventing vocabularies and the way they were inventing languages. And he said, you know, this seems really similar to what I see boxers doing in England. Right? There's a sporting press by the 1870s. It's not entirely respectable yet, but we have journalists. They're writing in, in this encrypted code. So to really understand what's going on, you've got to be deeply enmeshed in this language. And he notes that on a sociological level, I think I see the same thing happening here. I think I see members of an underclass in both countries creating artificial status structures for themselves. And you being able to master this other language is a sign of that status uh, structure. Now, whether Chinese boxers could actually claim any status, any social respect, was something that Lister very much doubted, right? He was interested in popular culture, but he never, ever romanticized it, right? Most of the art martial artists that he dealt with were people like patent medicine salesmen, right? Retired opera singers, soldiers, gamblers. You have a feeling he came across these people in his uh, judicial capacities, you know, so to speak. Gamblers, that last group, was especially interesting to him. Uh, he thought they deserved special consideration, probably because the martial artists in Aelin's Pig had been gamblers. And so that's where he kind of got his first real entrance into the world of martial arts was professional mob enforcers sort of a thing. Which, you know, take a look at the swords in that picture. You, you can kind of guess what kind of guys we're dealing with here, right? Yeah, absolutely. So this guy here has a ringed Dao on his back. This guy here, he's carrying a butterfly sword, kind of reversed grip, just like that. Right? And, and what they're doing is they're gambling here. Right? You know, so this is everything you want to see right? in one place. 
So gamblers, um, in an anonymously published article, almost certainly written by Lister, that came out in the North China Herald in 1873, we see Lister really beginning to hone his chops, right? He tells us the story of a challenge match between two gamblers who get into this impromptu fight in which one accidentally kills the other one, and it just destroys the entire community basically when this happens. And he relates the story as a way of kind of exploring the social milieu of the Chinese martial arts, its relationship with the government, but also to delve into the specialized vocabulary and to begin to make equivalences between the vocabulary of the Chinese martial arts and Western boxing. And he begins to fuse those two vocabularies so he can explain to his audience what is going on. And if that seems overly complicated to you, what you have to remember is in the 1870s, there was no accepted term for the Chinese martial arts. As a matter of fact, there was no one single unified concept of the Chinese martial arts, not just in English, but also in Chinese. Right? Uh, you know, this conceptual confusion shows itself linguistically. When, when you look through the English language literature, when you find people talking about the martial arts in the 19th century, they can't say martial art. You know, we don't use that term, you know, until the uh, 1970s, basically. They have to say things like boxing, gymnastics, juggling, dancing, training, acrobatics. Right? When you hear someone describing juggling in the marketplace, they're almost always talking about what you would consider to be just a very standard kind of kung fu demonstration. Right? But you know, they, they, they don't have those words yet. So mulling all of this kind of linguistic and, and conceptual confusion in his brain, Lister decided that you know, when, when I look at the Chinese martial arts, what I'm, what I'm actually seeing is the Chinese analog for, quote, the noble art of self-defense. All right, now that English phrase has been used to mean various things at different times. By the late 19th century, it was coming to be a nostalgic term that was used almost exclusively for boxing, or old-fashioned boxing, bare knuckles boxing, right? And it would, be kind, it would become kind of um, Lister's catch-all phrase. Now, in an earlier publication, Lister had noted that he was searching the popular literature for anything he could find on the Chinese martial arts, and he just was not finding anything written down. Right? So he concluded correctly that this is mostly an oral tradition. But luckily, something changed for him between the years 1872 and 1874, because in 1874, he returns to the China Review, this time in an anonymously published article called The Noble Art of Self-Defense. Uh, this work, signed LCP, begins with this extended discussion of kind of the uncanny parallel institutions that you see between China and the West, and that leads him to boxing as one of these parallel institutions, right? Now, Lister begins by claiming that the noble art of self-defense is a direct translation of this little pamphlet's title that he found in the marketplace that he's going to translate for you. And we know right from the get-go that that's BS, because he actually gives us the characters and the, you know, the, the, the title right down there. And if you look at it, you can, you know, he says, you know, this is a direct translation. And he puts an asterisk with the title. And then you go down and you check and it's like, yeah, it's nothing like a direct translation. It is totally, totally made that up, right? But you were supposed to get the joke. Um, a more direct translation of the book that he found was actually the tearing down techniques of hero boxing. And that makes sense because no one in southern China was using self-defense, noble or otherwise, as a marker for martial arts, uh, the names of martial arts styles at this point in time. Hero boxing, however, was super common. It is, you know, this little catchphrase that shows up in the names of uh, individual sets and individual techniques and individual styles all over the region. As a matter of fact, it's so common, it's a little infuriating. It makes it hard to kind of pin down, am I looking at proto choili foot? Is this proto hunga? I don't know. They all have hero boxing in them, you know, somewhere at this point in time. Now, it's actually significant that this manual that Lister found had a title because a lot of the Chinese um, boxing manuals that were being circulated at this point in time were handwritten, and they didn't have titles at all, uh, especially if they were related to medical texts. 
Unfortunately, this book had no author. At least no author was written. Uh, why was no author listed? Well, because it wasn't, strictly speaking, legal to publish a book on the Chinese martial arts in the late Qing dynasty. And if you did, you were likely to end up like those guys. OK, so you didn't want to do that. Um, it's then interesting to think about, well, how did this book come into Lister's hands? Well, he tells us he bought it in a, a stall in Guangzhou, which is just up the Pearl River from Hong Kong. So what's probably happening is this gray market literature is being published on one side of the border in Hong Kong, and it's being smuggled up the river where it can be sold in China, you know, easily. You know, it's like, you know, you can just ditch it if you get caught, you know, and, uh, and, and that's that. So this is uh, an example of gray market literature. And this border was very important. Uh, other scholars have looked a lot at publishing in this region and have determined that it was the existence of this international border that allowed an independent newspaper tradition, for instance, to, to begin to flourish in China. Now, in terms of describing his pamphlet, Lister noted that the book was small. Frustratingly, he doesn't give us exact dimensions. But he, he repeatedly states it's small, even compared to the kind of popular literature he's used to dealing with. It's printed on bad paper. Uh, it's, it has crudely executed wood blocks. It was sold for less than a penny. So even at that point in time, this was cheap enough it could be an impulse purchase for someone. Um, it was sold in the same kinds of stalls that carried opera scripts and songbooks and other types of popular literature, okay? So we know the class of literature that it was grouped in with. It was essentially a fight book, but it was also ephemera that was aimed at the working class. And the fact that we're dealing with ephemera is probably why we don't have any existing copies of this book 150 years later. Ephemera tends not to survive. <laughs> Lister describes this volume, here you can see some of the woodcuts from it, as being comprised of 12 pages, right? the first of which is a title page. After that, you have 11 instructional pages. Um, each of these pages has exactly the same format. We have two fighters. You know, so actually, I should you know, point this out. This would be one page this would be the other page, right? And the, uh, the European engraver squished those two pages together into one engraving panel to like save costs for the engraving. So, you know, that would be one page, right? Uh, we, have, we have two fighters. Um, let's see. Uh, the, initially we cover unarmed boxing, we cover pole fighting, uh, we cover butterfly swords, or hudie dao, and uh, we, we cover shields in this, okay? Uh, the hudie dao, it's interesting that they get so much coverage because that was a very popular weapon in southern China. Uh, yeah, there we go. The individual pages themselves um, are very similar to other fight books that have appeared in the region. So up at the top, you can see an example of the Bubishi, right? The Bubishi was a Fujianese manuscript tradition uh, that eventually made its way to Okinawa and, you know, was, was influential on the early, you know, creators of karate. Uh, just like the Bubishi, every one of these diagrams is read the same way. Uh, first, the fighter on the right attacks, and then the fighter on the left responds, and the fighter on the left always wins. Now, do you see the fighter on the left winning or the fighter on the left winning? No. So they're not trying to show you a specific moment from combat, right? It's a little bit more encoded than that. This gesture tells you what he is about to do. This gesture tells you how he is about to respond. Right? So it's a prompt. You kind of have to already know, oh yeah, he's going to make a guan sao, he's going to do you know, a high-low punch, right? so that you can actually accurately read this. It's not clear that Lister actually understood how these diagrams work, and that probably led him in his discussion to uh, mistake who the winners and losers in some of these battles were. Right? And of course, Lister couldn't understand how these diagrams work because he didn't have any comparative material to deal with. He'd only ever seen one of these books. Right? So that, that was his essential problem. Um, 
Now, Lister was fully aware that most of this material would be absolutely incomprehensible to a Western audience. And for him, that's a big problem, right? But I mean, that's a problem for Chinese martial artists today. Even if you, you know, can read classical Chinese and you are an experienced martial artist, you get one of those Qing Dynasty manuals and you open it up, it is incredibly frustrating. You can't understand anything from them. I mean, usually there are no pictures. It's just lists of names. Right? You know, it is impossible to kind of to grab meaning out of that. So rather than trying to directly translate these books, what Lister did, and you know, you can you can see here what he did, was he basically uh, reproduced two thirds of the woodcuts from the original book, right, in his article, and then he gave either direct translations in some cases or descriptions in other cases of what was happening on the page. And that brings up a question of, well, what was happening on the page? We know in each case we have a woodblock print and we know that the name of the technique is labeled. And Lister seems to imply that there is a, dis a, a brief discussion of the technique. Now, if this was a traditional Qing era hand copied manuscript, that would almost certainly be in rhymed couplets. And Lister, as a poetry critic, if there had been bad poetry about boxing, he would have told us, right? So we probably don't have rhymed couplets here. That would indicate that we, we probably have a prose discussion, unless he just made it up and added it. Because remember, that's what he did with his script of Aelin's pig, where he expected to find things that he didn't find things, he just shoved them in. So I've never really been able to decide whether there was a prose discussion or whether he thought that a prose discussion was just called for, right? But we know for sure that we have images of the techniques and we, we have labels. And that would be fairly standard. Like, you know, the Bubishi has a chapter in it that is almost exactly like that, very, very similar. Okay, um, now in addition to describing the text, so you can see, you know, here what I did is, you know, I, I, I took the figures from Lister, told you what the description was in them, and then from there tried to work backwards to a reconstruction of what the original tearing down techniques of hero boxing manual would have looked like, right? So it had this very orderly structure to it. First we have our unarmed boxing, then our pole fighting, then our weapons fighting, which is almost all uh, butterfly sword based. In addition to knowing what's in here, we need to know a little bit about what didn't make it into this little book. One of the things that's interesting about this, it makes it very different from say the Bubishi that I was just talking about, is there's no historical discussion in it, right? We know that these are the techniques of hero boxing, but we don't know what hero boxing is. We don't know who invented it, right? There's no lineage claim. There's no creation mythology, right? And, and that's important. Uh, I told you we didn't have an author. We also don't have the kind of prefaces that you normally see in a Chinese martial arts book, you know, in which you have some third party who is kind of vouching for its effectiveness, right? So you don't really have any front matter with this book. There is no theoretical uh, material in the book, right? There's no discussion of like the five elements or anything like that. There are also no medical texts, which were commonly seen in conjunction with these sorts of fight books. So this is as close to a pure martial arts manual as, as you can get. Again, commercially printed in the 1870s, which is a problem for my friend who I started off by talking, Kennedy, right? So Kennedy, this is, he's kind of given us our standard reference work on Chinese fight books, right? And he says, we've got five classes of, you know, of Chinese fight books. Everything basically falls into one of these classes. Uh, the first is like the mythological texts, you know, that may, you know, really, really ancient stuff. We only have the titles preserved from like old library catalogs. Then you have the old woodcut texts. These come from the Ming Dynasty, right? Uh, this is like the big military encyclopedias. That's really the beginning of the modern discussion of the Chinese martial arts, right? And those were commercially printed with uh, woodblocks. And then after that, in the Qing dynasty, you don't get any more commercial printing because the Qing won't allow it. So the only martial arts manuals you see are hand copied manuscript traditions. And then after 1911, when there is the explosion of nationalism, that's when you get the modern fight book tradition that, that we still have today, okay? 
So now do you see the problem? We have a printed, commercially sold Kung Fu manual 40 years before it's supposed to exist, right? There shouldn't be any commercial printing going on at this particular point in time. So what's going on here, right? Is this book a one-off, right? Is this an individual publisher's hobby? Was there some like rogue publisher in Canton that was like way into Kung Fu? Or is this a sign that, you know, there was more going on with the Chinese martial arts than we generally know? Well, I'm going to opt for the later, right? It is difficult to rely on Chinese sources to figure out what totally is going on with the Chinese martial arts because uh, the, the local histories, the family histories that you need to rely on are produced by Confucian scholars. And those Confucian scholars, as you can see, have a very different set of social values than our martial artists. And it's not that there were never, you know, scholars that were interested in boxing or rich people that were interested in boxing. I mean, that happened, but it was never socially respectable. So when you're writing your family history, when you're writing your local documents, they just would kind of be really quiet about the boxing. I mean, it would get played down or you just make it disappear. And so it's hard to get a sense of what's really going on in this local environment, uh, just from the, the local sources. But luckily, because this is Guangzhou and we're in the 19th century, we've got imperialism. We've got all kinds of people running all over the place. We've got everyone from British naval officers to Spanish pirates all writing you know, accounts of what they're seeing. And sometimes they find martial artists and these guys are writing accounts of martial artists and those are very important if often neglected historical sources. So, where can we uh, find something that would help? In 1829, the Canton Register published an article, almost certainly written by William Woodman, uh, William <laughs> White Woodman, no, William Whiteman Wood, right, though he didn't sign it, uh, called Pugilism in China. And I would like to read you just like the top part of that there. He says, the art of self-defense is regularly taught in China. It is much practiced, although not countenanced by the local government. In the penal code, nothing appears concerning it. Tracts are printed, which would in all probability, accompanied by their woodcuts, amuse the fancy in England. The Chinese have no pitched battles that we have heard of, but we have seen a pamphlet on the subject of boxing, cudgeling, and sword exercises in which there are many fanciful terms, right? Then he goes on to basically give you the table of contents beneath it. Now that's really interesting. So now this is 1829, Lister is 1874. In 1829, we have another European who has come across another commercially printed piece of like ephemera fight book material. And the basic outline that he gives you is very close, with one exception. In Wood's manual in 1829, the entire front part of it is all about basic physical training. It's about weightlifting and punching heavy bags and physical development, right? So strength training in the Chinese martial arts. In 1874, um, Lister's manual doesn't have any of that physical development material. It goes straight for like, you know, the kung fu and the skewering people. So we know that they're probably not looking at the same pamphlet. These are two different books. Though interestingly, there is overlap between them. For instance, one of the unarmed techniques in Lister's book is called um, tiger catch, A Hungry Tiger Catches the Sheep. That's also listed in Wood's book. So there is some continuity in regional techniques between these two things. So 40 years of very violent history separates them, you know, but this suggests, again, that rather than this being an isolated work, you know, we have a genre. I think Lister really throws Wood's work into much sharper relief than, you know, you'd normally get. 
Um, and it indicates, again, something important about how these things are being sold and who's selling them, right? I argued in my 2015 volume on the history of Wing Chun that the commercial demonstration of martial arts instruction began in the Pearl River Delta region in Guangdong in the mid-19th century. And it was certainly in full swing by the end of this era. Now, there are other authors that will go unnamed. Um, actually, it's Brian Kennedy. Um, there are other authors you know, who have stated that no, there was no commercial martial arts instruction in China before 1911. Right? That was invented by the Jing Wu Association, and it was Jing Wu who spread that. You could not have had this in traditional Chinese society. And I gotta say, I love the Jingwu Association, right? You know, these guys are fantastic, and they did a lot to reform the Chinese martial arts and to make it publicly available and to produce a progressive image of the Chinese martial arts in people's minds. Still, I don't think you can generalize like this, right? I'm interested in the Pearl River Delta region precisely because it was so economically advanced, right? It was the center of trade uh, for the entire region, right? All global trade in China was funneled through Guangzhou, you know, up until the end of the Opium Wars, you know, and, and it was a, an important regional place. Uh, the iron monopoly for southern China was in Foshan, Foshan. If you wanted a knife or a wok or anything else made out of iron, you had to go to Foshan to get it, right? There were merchants that had caravans coming through this area. There was Im immense amounts of money moving through this area, and what that meant was that there was a de demand for security. So you get a lot of money and a demand for security, and that allows for the creation of a marketplace fairly early on. So now, when we see commercially printed ephemera aimed at working class martial artists, in the 1820s, in the 1870s, yeah, that really confirms that we have a monetization of the Chinese martial arts happening in this specific region. We really do have a marketplace, and you can buy a primer for your kung fu class, or at least your aspirations for taking a kung fu class. We're not really sure how they were used. In conclusion, I would like to, to return a little bit and think more now about Alfred Lister and his role in spreading a certain level of understanding of the Chinese martial arts to his readers in uh, the 19th century. So Lister wrote that one article anonymously and um, it, it really made a splash. It, people liked it so much, it got republished multiple times, including like decades after its first publication, it was still being republished. So it had a big impact kind of on the reading populace. As a matter of fact, uh, in the 1890s, the Straits Times actually republished that article, and the editor of the Straits Times outed Lister as its author even though Lister had tried to cover his identity because he said some really nasty things about fellow administrators in the colony. And that, you know, so it was, it was kind of a scandal again when he got identified as the author. Um, throughout this work and all the other little works that he did, one of the things that we see is Lister struggling over and over again to come to terms with this question of what is Chinese boxing? You know, recall again that that modern concept of the martial arts that we all take for granted, you know, is this kind of convenient catch-all phrase that is what allows all of us to sit in this room together did not exist yet, or at least it didn't, it was not stabilized in this way yet, okay? So he had to work out on his own what is it exactly that connects opera performance and fights between professional gambling thugs, and that guy selling patent medicine in the market, and then the exercises I see in the barracks in Guangzhou. Because it can't all be the same thing. But it all looks like the same thing, kind of, not really, a little bit. And it happens in all of these places that aren't related to each other, except all of these people are very marginal. They're all at the bottom of Chinese society, right? And so Lister thinks and he thinks and he tries to put this together. 
I think this is one of the areas where Lister's personal theory of translation really began to complicate things. Rather than you know, starting with that question and then delving more deeply, say, into the social history of soldiers and um, gamblers and uh, you know, boxers or, 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 uh, or opera performers, instead, what he did was he turned immediately to this metaphor of Western boxing and the romantic notions that came with it, notions like working class individuals can solve their differences and demonstrate their manhood through a vigorous but constrained um, round of fisticuffs, right? You know, boxing almost as like an athletic exhibition for an appreciative audience. That's kind of what Lister has lodged in his head, even though he doesn't really like Western boxers either, but that, that's his model of boxing, right? And then he has to be very disappointed when he notes that, you know, these Chinese laborers never get in fights. It doesn't matter how much they're insulting each other, they never box. And, and if a fight does break out, you know what they do? They pick up a brick and try to kill the other guy. Right? You know, they don't get into fist fights. They just go right for improvised weapons, you know, and they're going to get it over with. Uh, and this is very confusing for him. In truth, the Chinese martial arts have been, through their history, many things to many people. But during the late 19th century, the one thing that Chinese boxing was not was a sporting event. Right? There, there was no concept of sports in late 19th century Chinese society. Uh, at least not as we think of them now. You know, Lister notes with disappointment that when you think back to that uh, table of contents I put up, only two lessons from this book deal exclusively with unarmed combat. So that's 20% of the book. The other 80% of the book focuses on defending yourself with a weapon from someone else who has a weapon. You know, probably a pole, a butterfly sword, or a set of shields. Now, Lister never spends much time thinking about the social and the historical implications of these weapons, but I think we should. Because in the, middle, in the middle years of the 19th century, we're a very dangerous time to live in southern China, right? This region saw in quick succession the Opium Wars, the Red Turban Revolt, a persistent state of civil war between the uh, Hakka minority group and the Cantonese linguistic community. Um, the Red Turban Revolt alone claimed tens of thousands of battlefield deaths. Uh, then you have the Taiping Rebellion, a little bit further north, that was fun. If that wasn't enough, during the 19th century, there were three separate major piracy outbreaks in which there were fleets of pirates with tens of thousands of ships that were taking and burning major cities. And in the midst of all of this chaos, the Chinese were really worried that the British were just going to seize the Pearl River, right? Because they needed the line of communication and they weren't willing to put up with the pirates anymore, right? So, so you also have like serious acts of foreign aggression. The upshot of all this is there are multiple points in the mid 19th century when basically the entire male population of the Pearl River region is put under arms, right? This was very serious. Everybody was forced into militia service at some point. You were either going to fight to protect your home village or you were going to be shipped off to fight in larger led gentry armies and kind of like bigger military problems. What was the most common weapon that these militia troops got? Well, you were issued either a long pole or a long spear, a set of butterfly swords, and maybe a rattan shield. Yeah, there were guns, right? Every one of these militia units got a few matchlocks, you know, a few European rifles. But the truth is the government saved most of their guns for the regular troops, right? They were the one, and they all had guns, right? They, but they were the ones with the guns. So if you were in a militia, chances are you were going into battle with a pole or a set of butterfly swords or, uh, or, or, or shields. And, Again, we have these great intelligence reports by British naval officers 
you know, in absolute disbelief as they are watching, you know, 3,000, 4,000 Chinese recruits at a time training with butterfly swords and that this is what is going to be coming after them, right? Um, you know, here, here you can see, you know, uh, you know an, uh, it's, it's a staged photograph, but that's what these guys would have looked like. You know, so there's your rusty old musket, and they both have, you know, sets of butterfly swords and the ubiquitous bamboo helmets. The, actually, the Chinese were way ahead of the curve on realizing that everyone in the infantry needed a helmet. Okay? <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, like, that's the single most important piece of armor that you can have going out there. All right. So... Let's think specifically about the butterfly swords. They, they come up over and over again in this manual. This is a weapon that originated in southern China, Guangdong province, in the late 18th or early 19th century. Well, double weapons are very popular throughout China, this particular form with the hooked quillions and the short one-sided blades is unique to the region. Right? Anyone who's familiar with something like Hunga or Wing Chun can, can attest that this is really like the martial soul of southern China. Here's a set of butterfly swords that are actually in the collection, you know, upstairs someplace. Um, when you find a manual that devotes, you know, half of its pages to the discussion of butterfly swords, you can be very confident about where this thing was made. Right? You know, this is a representation of local martial culture. This pamphlet was not printed somewhere else and imported. This is not an example of a badly reproduced Ming era encyclopedia. They didn't have those back then, right? Well, there are many questions that we are not going to be able to answer about the reconstruction of hero boxing because of the, the nature of Lister's publication. There are certain things that we can know, right? We know the intended audience. We know the mixture of techniques that were going into this. And that tells us a lot about the, cons the concerns and the social environment that Chinese martial artists faced in the 1820s to 1870s in Guangzhou. Now, despite his best efforts, which were really legitimately pioneering, Lister never could grasp how the Chinese martial arts functioned in a broader social community, or even how that community's needs and definition of security might be different from his own. I mean, he was trapped in you know, Western paradigms, and so he saw boxing on the one hand. Sometimes he looked at it and said, this is kind of outdated military training, and sometimes he looked at it and said, you know, this is like really weird sparring practice where nobody ever actually spars. So, you know, there you go, a critique of the Chinese martial arts that we think is quite new, no, it, it's not. It's a critique that it was literally the first critique that was made, which is important because while other people have said that, Lister was the guy who published it. And that article got republished and republished and republished. And yeah, the Chinese were certainly aware of what was floating around out there. And so ironically, when you get to the Republic period after the 1911 revolution, and now there's a whole new generation of Chinese martial arts reformers, rather than doubling down on what made the Chinese martial arts unique, you know what they did instead? They responded to these foreign criticisms. They remade the Chinese martial arts either to be a more efficient form of military training or a more efficient form of athletic training, right? And, you know, and so there's the irony of all of this. In the final analysis, I think it may be difficult to disagree with Lister's assertion that we cannot translate, we cannot make something legible across cultural boundaries without at the same time transforming it. And that begins by transforming our discussion of it. The thing is, Lister never anticipated how profound that conversion would be or that it would come to encompass the very future of the Chinese martial arts themselves. Thank you very much. So the official Qing military, the um, 
you know, the Manchu, the Banner Troops or the Green Standard Army, those, those guys never used butterfly swords. Uh, the butterfly swords were a local weapon, and so they were issued to the militia troops uh, because it was something that you know, they were familiar with and it was in their own martial culture and martial context. Um, butterfly swords, though, have some really interesting advantages to them. If you have someone who has already learned to box, it's relatively easy to say, here, box with these, as opposed to say, I am now going to train you in the use of the military, you know, single edge knife, you know, which could take like three years to train, right? So I, I think it is a question of, this is what they are familiar with. And it doesn't have to be a super large weapon because butterfly swords are a sidearm, right? Your main weapon is your pole, right? That you have a pole or a spear that is three meters long you fight with your butterfly sword. Um, it, 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 well, some specialized troops always fought with butterfly swords, but most people fight with the butterfly swords if they lose their pole. So it's a sidearm, all right? And so that makes it useful. Yeah? I have a question in the comments. Uh, mm -hmm. first, my question, what's this thing on the right? <laughs> what, which, what, what thing on the right? Uh, the gentleman on the right has this staff. So this is, so, okay, so this is interesting. This is, this is where you run up against the limits of Lister's understanding of the text, right? Let's talk about these two images. Lister apparently did not understand that the guy on the right always loses, right? And he didn't, he wasn't really thinking as an art historian in terms of how you would interpret these pictures either. So this particular technique is called snake, uh, no, it's, a, it's called, um, uh, the crane and the oyster, or something like that, or the heron and the oyster. And it, it's a referencing a Chinese uh, folktale slash proverb about a crane that tries to stab an oyster to eat it, and the oyster closes on its beak, and neither will let go until the fisherman comes along and says, oh, I guess I get to eat an oyster and a crane for dinner. <laughs> okay, so that's where the name of this technique comes from. Which tells you there's something missing in this picture. The fisherman. This is a technique about a guy that we do not see, okay? In an infantry tactic was to have an individual with two shields. He didn't have a weapon, he had two shields. Those two shields could be used to make a defensive screen. They could also be used to encumber someone else's weapon. And when you had encumbered this guy's weapon, the fisherman, your buddy behind you with the spear, comes and skewers him, okay? So again, this is more, these, these images are encoded, right? You've got to know what's actually going on. Th this isn't about a duel between someone with, you know, two shields and a duel, you know, and, and a guy with a spear. This is a discussion of infantry tactics, right? Your shock troops encumber, your spears aren't in the front, they're one row back, right? Same thing here. So here you see a guy with short swords, kind of a variant of a Houdier Dao. Uh, and he has caught in you know, the quillion uh, this guy's forearm. And Lister assumes that this is supposed to be the winning technique. It's telling you to use your quillion to catch this sword. And he's like, you know, only a born fool would do that. I, I can't figure out why the Chinese think that this is a good idea. Well, they don't, right? <laughs> this is the losing side, right? This is the winning side. What does that tell you? Well, it tells you that if, if you are using your quillion, you can't catch a long weapon with it because that long weapon is a lever. He's going to rip that thing out of your hand and chop you, right? You know, this is a conceptual lesson that when you're making a bridge with your hands, you just make a bridge with your hands, but when you're making a bridge with weapons, you have to think about the relative strength slash length of the weapons that are being bridged. Don't do this. <laughs> right? And, and, you know, and Lister kind of profoundly missed that. Right? But again, the fact that you're having these conversations implies that we're not just talking about martial artists fighting duels. We're talking about militia and infantry here. Right? Because there's a third guy that didn't make it into that picture who's the, actually the one who's going to win in this technique. Now I see the two shields. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This kind of 
Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, 15th century to the 1860s. Mm -hmm. And metal form was the proportion for us. It was already upside down. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, and yeah. They, they disposed of it. Well, they're not metal helmets, they're bamboo. In that case, it's bamboo. Which is very important because the bamboo. Um, has a flex and give, right? And so it can take a concussive blow and not split. It can also take a sword hit and like trap the sword but not split. So, you know, the Chinese were perfectly capable of making metal helmets and metal shields, but they're like, no, we want woven bamboo because it's tougher. I mean, the woven bamboo shields that they had could actually stop musket balls. They could not stop European rifled fire, but they could stop Japanese and Chinese musket balls, right? You know, and it's because it's a woven technology, right? Last question. Yes. We know that he is like uh, responsible for the harbor, and then there's the pirates, and he does not combine these these two things, right? Mm -hmm. He doesn't see it in the, in the fight. So well, the, the pirates were not stupid. The pirates were not going to mess with. The, uh, the British naval troops, you know, in Hong Kong, because that was a good way to die if you're a pirate, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's the Chinese who get the pirates. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so thank you very much.